Appreciate it. Uh, it's great to be here. It's my first uh, proper systems meeting, and regrettably, I can only be here for today because of family issues. I was hoping to spend the whole week here. It's, I think it's a great community, um, exciting mix of science in these clinics. And so what uh, I'd like to touch on a little bit are the different scales of interactions within solid earth processes, perhaps as relevant for the community here. This is the sort of thing that, that I normally work on, trying to understand the planetary evolution on, on the larger scales. Doing this with forward models, we're trying to explain certain data sets in certain regions, and in ab initio models that try to explain the general plan form of convection. And when you look at something like this sketch here from SC40, then all that usually becomes this one error, which says tectonics. And and, and to, to some extent, it would be nice, right? Because then um, I didn't have to worry about you. You wouldn't have to worry about me. We could all be in our little happy silos, but it's not quite as simple. And of course, we know that everything is linked in the sense that mantle convection is the reason for plate tectonics. Therefore, all tectonic activity, including orogeny, which was pointed out by, by Holmes, Interestingly, right, decades before plate tectonics was actually accepted. And we know more specifically, for example, from work from um, Yafaldano and others and Mead and Conrad, that there are certain settings, such as the orogeny in the Andes, where a good case can be made that the plate velocities uh, sense what is happening at the interface, and that the growth of the mountain, as shown here in uh, paleotopography constraints, um, leads to an increase in the shear stress forces on the plate boundary, and that perhaps slows plate boundaries down. So we know that there are some interactions, and it's kind of useful to then ask, well, which, which of the driving forces, which of the governing terms are the most important? And um, if you do some sort of local analysis as to how plate tectonics works, then it comes down to a balance of viscous dissipation and slab pull to first. And the thermal boundary layer models of Oxberg and Turcot and others in the 60s did that. And so you can consider a slab going down here. And then if you balance uh, the slab pull force that is written here as a thermal, um, uh, thermal buoyancy force with dissipation in the convecting mantle where we have the mantle viscosity here, then that sets any sort of time scale. That's the Stokes velocity, the velocity of a, of a sinker that has a certain density and it's modulated by the ambient viscosity. But when you then um, do things a little bit more carefully and you consider the lateral viscosity variations that are expected given the temperature depends of viscosity, um, then Clint Conrad and others have shown that the dissipation within the bending plate, which is this term here that strongly depends on the bending radius, might be quite important. The stronger the slab, the more important that term is. And then there's this other pesky thing, which is the interface shear strength, where if you consider the brittle shallow interface, the stresses are perhaps quite small, but you also have to consider the lower uh, shear zone component of that plate boundary, and then this term can matter. And the nice thing about this force balance is we can do simple estimates. And so, for example, when you then predict the plate velocity as a function of slab viscosity compared to mantle viscosity, then particularly for strong slabs, you have a reduction in the plate velocities and that reduction depends on the bending rates. And there have been decades of work trying to understand subduction models based on isolated plates, perhaps an overriding plate, trying to explore the role of bending. But as it turns out, slabs may overall not be very strong. Based on temperature dependence alone, they would be you know, orders of magnitude, many orders of magnitude stronger than the mantle, but it appears that there's some process reducing the strength in the bending rate. And if we look in seismic tomography, slabs are bent, you know, they're sort of squishy, and we can think about the microphysical mechanisms that lead to that strength reduction. And plastic behavior is, is one, um, one such mechanism where in terms of an instantaneous behavior, we can look at the Christmas tree diagram, and we can see that there are these regions where piles plasticity might be active and sort of taking a chunk out of the lithospheric strength profile. 
there's some evidence from geodetic inversion that we're seeing such a reduction in viscosity in this abducting plate based on Tohoku Oki post seismic data. And we can then also worry about, so the second order features, and recently it's been suggested that an interplay of brittle and ductile damage might lead to a segmentation of slabs which then um, might be reflected in some of the seismic tomography images we're seeing. And in the end, the behavior of the slab is sort of like a, a toy snake that can be pulled, transmitted, but it's quite easily bent. And so what does that mean? Well, if the slab is just a couple of hundred times stronger than the asthenosphere, then we have very different force transmission. Here's fairly old work by my former student, um, Adam Holt, illustrating the horizontal stress field where red means compression, blue means extension for two different time steps where there's a slab going down here. And we'll be interested, we're interested in this region. And you can see for this weak slab, it's only a hundred times stronger than the mantle. You have very different behavior for a strong slab. And you can also see that the stresses in the overriding plate are time different, right? So if we're talking about this tectonics arrow, then how that arrow works and how the forces are transmitted depends on the slab strength. The lower the slab strength, the more important the overriding plate, and that whole thing is time dependent. And that time dependence can be quite pronounced if you have things like slab folding, as we saw in the seismic tomography. So you have variations on time scales of millions of years, perhaps even short. Now, what does that do to our plate velocity? If the slab has a viscosity relative to the mantle of around 300, then we can explore what happens if we change the shear zone viscosity. So as the shear zone viscosity increases for certain lengths and aspect ratios of the shear zone, you can have a significant increase, uh, decrease in plate speeds, sorry, and you can have an, have an increase in the actual shear stress accommodated in that deep viscous shear zone. And so this is a very simplified Exercise based on force balance, it doesn't include shear heating and other feedback processes, but it's intriguing because it says that if slabs behave as we think they might in a relatively weak sort of fashion, then the interface matters. And so what uh, Whitney Bear and I suggested is then if you then look at different types of interfaces, then you can you know, explore based on field observations on PT, ET conditions and based on laboratory constraints on uh, creep loss for slabs that have basalt turning into eclogite or uh, slabs that are covered, oceanic plates that are covered by sediments, you have very different viscosities. And so this is the plot turned on the side. And this would suggest that for a particular slab pole, a particular length of the slab, if you have eclogite of the surface and has higher viscosity, you have fairly, fairly low plate speeds. And if there are sediments coming in, those sediments can serve to lubricate plate motion. It's not a new suggestion that has been, you know, uh, proposed again for the Andes by Lamb and Davies and others. But what that means is that now the interface itself isn't just important, but it also matters what comes into the interface, right? So the geology in this sense has an effect on plate speeds perhaps. And this might matter on short time scales, but it may also matter on long time scales. If you look at the convergence of India with respect to Eurasia, here plotted in terms of absolute and orthogonal velocities, then there's this well-known increase, and then the decrease at some point, there's collision. And what we suggested is that it might be that this is perhaps associated with an equatorial bulge here where the Tethian uh, lithosphere might have had a carpet of pelagic sediments lubricating the plate. So that raises then interesting questions as to what might be happening in terms of the overall evolution of the planet, right? The formation of the continents, orogeny, increased sedimentation ro um, rates, mass flux, changing what is happening at the plate boundaries, leading to a feedback with, um, with the deep earth. And that's quite interesting. And similar things were suggested by Sobolev and Brown a year later. And so since then, we've done a bit more work on the role of the interface. Uh, these particular computations use the aspect mental convection code, about which we'll hear some later in, in the clinics. And so it turns out when you run these little um, dynamic models, I'm going to restart it here. Particularly interesting, they have, um, they have, a, have a layer 
of um, different viscosity crust in it. And then as a function of the interface viscosity here, 10 to the 21, 20, and decreasing to 10 to the 18, which would then be uh, roughly what, um, like 100 times um, uh, weaker than the upper mantle, you have enhanced rollback and you also have an increase in, in, in subduction velocities. And so the, the nice thing is you can then take these fully dynamic models and bring it back to an analysis that is akin to the force balance analysis, even though those are fully time evolving, there's rollback and other things, and you can show for it um, the convergence velocity here as a function of the interface viscosity, mantle viscosity uh, for different um, shear zone aspect ratios, you have again this decrease in convergence velocity as a function of interface speed. So rollback and plate speeds are enhanced by the sediment cover and, you know, the more the sediments, the, the faster the rollback and also the faster the convergence speed. Now we are currently exploring these um, variations in three dimensions. This is work by, uh, by Neuhardt and others. I'm not involved in this and I'm um, trying to do similar tests looking here at the um, uh, stress like this, and the stress uh, long strike, here topography and there's incoming, uh, incoming uh, plate material with different viscosities and you can get similar responses. And uh, the next step is then to take a look and see how surface um, transport matters and how the mass rebalancing at the surface then interfaces and to explore these feedbacks between orogeny and rollback. Now, in terms of mass transport, given that I'm at a surface process focused meeting, I thought I'd show one result um, from work where we actually did explore the role of surface processes, this is now quite old, but Boris Kaus, my former student, um, Claire Steedman, where we have a setting here, there's a pretty complicated um, lithosphere coming in uh, with sediments, upper crust, lower crust, and then a mantle lithosphere. And there's some sort of overriding plate, there's a free surface. And we then explore the role of erosion and sedimentation. And it's a very simplified description. It's just some sort of hill slope diffusion thing that smooths out and transports uh, mass away without any consideration of deposition, which of course we should. And so what you see is then um, in terms of the large scale behavior here, there's the slab and here are these uh, layers um, of the crust. And so those are models that were a little bit tailored to Taiwan. We were very interested in the exhumation and just comparing the case without erosion and the case with very fast erosion, you see that there's a bit of a change in the large scale dynamics, bit of the change in the rates, and that's due to what's happening at the interface. But the major effect really is not surprisingly, perhaps that you have way more exhumation if you have like a vacuum cleaner, cleaner sucking up the mass on top of it. So the, the shallow dynamics, of course, very much affected by surface processes and mass redistribution, but the deep dynamics, perhaps not so much. So with this in mind, we then continued to see what happens in particular in a subduction set, um, setting, looking a little bit at what's going on at the mantle wedge, where we have all these interesting processes, um, different, we have the building up of an accretionary wedge. Uh, we have perhaps underplating, recirculation, and we want to understand these, these different pathways, starting with trying to do a better job at representing the, um, the accretionary wedge. And so this is, these are results, some work by Silvia Brizzi, former postdoc of mine, who uh, worked a lot with um, Ilona van Dinter, and this is a large group of authors. And so these models in theory can really go across the, the timescales. We're not concerning ourselves here with the earthquake timescale. We're just running um, these, these models with um, you know, fairly complex uh, layering of uh, real, different rheologies and different materials and uh, changing the sediment thickness, right? And so what we, we expected based on these other models and sort of the general um, observation of the force balance is that we would see an increase in plate speeds if the incoming sediment layer um, is changed in, in terms of its thickness, for example. And we saw sort of the opposite. And, and what happens is that the average velocity of the slab actually decreases, and this, these colors here, um, particularly these colors here are sediment thickness, the thicker the sediments, the um, slower the plate speeds. And you can imagine there wasn't uh, 
particularly fun to just have one paper saying the opposite of, of the other that we just published. But what turns out in, in these models is that you build these, <clears throat> this really big accretionary wedge, and that leads both to an increase in the shear stress due to the increased overburden, and more importantly, an increase in the length of the plate interface. The secondary effect is that there's a bit of a reduction in slab pull, you know, depending on how you set up the model. So when you look at wedge dynamics, there are certain scenarios, be they realistic or not, where thick sediments can decrease the plate velocity by increasing the sort of interface, going from a small to wide accretionary wedge and, um, and, and having, having a, a stronger effect of, of shear. And so that's interesting. That's a complication that we want to understand better and it might apply differently in different regions, but slabs also don't live in isolation and they interact with each other. And I want to sort of close by a couple of comments, bringing things back to the larger scales. The larger scale we can think of are global scales. And it turns out that plate velocities and different plate reference frames are shown here, are showing a net rotation of the lithosphere with respect to the deep mantle. So everything moves a couple of centimeters sort of westward like the Pacific plate moves, for example, in hotspot reference frame. That matters. If you're worried about where slabs are going relative to the surface, what's happening with rollback and things like that. It turns out, work by my former student, Melanie Jerome, that I'd kind of forgotten about is that the weak zone viscosity based on these two dimensional models, having slabs and keels as drivers of flow to explore the role of net rotations, affect the net rotation. So the stronger the weak zone viscosity, the more net rotation within limits, there's sort of a soft, there's a sweet spot here and the weak zone width also matters and it's always a trade-off between the two. Now, I was reminded of that work when Shi Zhizhong pointed out this paper to me, this is work by Ma and Zong from two years ago where they run global circulation models, put in density anomalies based on different approaches and you can match the plate velocities. And then they show that if you have lateral variations in the weak zone, if say the Western Pacific is weaker than the Eastern Pacific, then you can have a change in plate velocities. In particular, you have an increase in this degree one toroidal flow, which is the net rotation. So there are global effects. The whole lithosphere is doing something differently if you have lateral variations in shear zone strength. And this is just to say that these cross scale interactions matter because if you're looking at things like advancing and retreating trenches in a region such as in Japan to understand as shown here, the deformation patterns, if you're trying to understand the background stress state to then further analyze what's going on over the cycle or during orogeny, you need to understand these um, global reference frames and the global reference frames themselves depend on what is happening in slabs as is shown here in this old simulation by Xi Zhizhong and Mike Ernest showing you that how rollback changes um, once and if the slab penetrates through 660. So we have these cross scale interactions where slabs are being controlled by sediments, their trajectory throughout the mantle then affects large scale pressure fields which can change the net rotation and that will change the way that slabs make it into the mantle. Uh, it's a challenge to explore this. We're trying to do so in an earthquake context with a recently funded NSF FRES project where we're also running summer schools. So if you're interested in these things in an earthquake, earthquake focus, I encourage you to reach out. But I wanna conclude um, with this recognition that slabs may well be relatively weak and if this is the case, the interface may matter, not so much the brittle interface, but the deep ductile shear zone. Those plate boundary stresses for sure matter to modulate plate speeds. Lateral variations may matter on global scales and the sediment transfer can serve to lubricate or gum up the interface. And um, there's these possibly global effects of local plate boundary mass transport. Thank you. Thank you, Thorsten, for like giving us sort of the like huge picture um, of like deep earth. Um, are there any questions? We'll take at least one. We maybe have two. I can like. Hi, Thorsten. Thanks for the nice talk. Um, you you showed plots kind of parameterizing the rollback in terms of the sediments and also eclogite there. Is there no effect of the slab age 
Oh, for, for sure. The this, slab okay. age. So that the slab age. It, this is all for constant slab age. Okay. And so the slab age sets uh, mainly the thickness, and that will affect the slab pull, but also the bending in a complicated way. This is why these bending analyses are kind of annoying. And so those were all at fixed radius. And then for um, for these malls. You know, it probably says somewhere like a hundred, hundred million years, and so um, it it will. The interface will always matter, but then the thickness will affect the, the specifics of the trajectories. So you can think of the age of setting like a background, and then on top of that, you vary this the interface strength, and it will still have relatively the same effect. Absolutely, it's going to look different. Are there other questions? Um... Tamara. Thank you for the talk, it was super interesting. <clears throat> um, uh, my question is related with the stress. If, if these models can help us to see the stress changes in the overriding plate, because I'm trying to link with the, like what happened in the surface and how, how that can impact the topography that we are studying in surface processes. So if what is happening in the deep, the slab and how that's changing the stress of the up overriding plate. Yes, and so, so here is here's one example, um, which shows the horizontal compressive stress. When this is negative in red, it's compressive and vice versa. And that just illustrates that in the case of the weak slab, you have way more compression, for example, than in the case of the strong slab. And in general, the rule is the more messed up the slab, the more important the overrunning plate. For example, if you have classically weakened slab, the thickness of the overrunning plate matters because it affects the pressures at the interface. And so, yes, so the answer is yes, it's kind of complicated. And just a follow up question. And because I think it's interesting and hard to answer how uh, these models can help us to understand the time scale of those changes. If a slab is weak, how, like in how long we will see that um, reflected in the overriding plate or. Like yeah, so, um, you know, this kind of stuff where we work with Taras Guerra and Dave Bercovici, you can, you can look at the segmentation here, for example, and that segmentation makes predictions in terms of the offset of faults in the seafloor. And so you can measure that and you can quantify that. You can go long strike where the plate age changes and you can see how that spacing changes. So that would give you an idea, for example, of the intensity, right? But then in terms of the time scales, right? It's a, it's a, it's a very good question, right? For certain problems, all I'm talking about might just be that one vector, right? That says tectonics. For others, you might have to um, take these interactions into account. And I think if you're talking about building a mountain over five to 10 million years or something like that, for sure, right? If you're talking about very short time scale things, then, um, then maybe these interactions are less important. And as you know, right, it's not just the time, it's also the spatial scales, right? And so, for example, there's, there's going to be a clinic, right, by um, John Nabilov later, where people have put surface evolution models on top of, of aspect, and there you can, you can answer that question empirically. Right. But of course, we understand analytically some of the answers, and I think others are just more complicated. And that's where the exciting work happens. Right. Thank you. That was 